This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Danny, Kagan, Giovanni, Shiloh, and Manisha. Welcome, everyone, to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thank you for joining us today. I'm here with Stephen Russell to talk about his upcoming Iraq memoir coming out soon called The Troublemakers, The Greatest Dog and Pony Show in Iraq. And Stephen is also a comic book author, and we're going to talk about that a little bit too. Stephen, welcome to Fortress on a Hill. How are you today? Doing all right. Thank you, Henry. It's good to be here. And it's good to have you here to talk to. So let's, let's start by talking a little bit about your upcoming book. It's a memoir of yours from that time in Iraq, both some of the time before you left being there. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot of lessons I think that people can learn from going through the things that you share. That's really broad, obviously, but you talked about watching or seeing your, was it, I sure remember there was the sniper incident that you mentioned. And I guess I can let you, I can let you tell that in more detail if we get into it, but the, but it's a profound impact on somebody to see something like that, to go through something like that and to take in everybody else's pain around that. But please tell the, the listeners what your book was about, your book is about and what your goals with it are. Absolutely. Yeah. So the generalization would be the book is about my deployment to Iraq in my unit, Bravo Company 112 Cav. It was the third heavy brigade combat team that we were deployed to the Diala province, which was where like the most intense fighting happened during the surge. And for people who aren't, aren't too familiar with a lot of what was going on, this stuff is three years removed from the invasion. And then I think maybe a year removed from Fallujah. And we had Sadr City right after that. And so the next big combat push that the army had in the area was the surge. And the surge was a response to the entire country it had just fallen apart. They were going through a civil war and there was just pure chaos going on at the time. There was no real functioning government. There was no, the army was acting as a stand in government for the country and even at its best still couldn't make that happen. And that, that was their intent was to bring as many soldiers over into the country as possible, increase the intensity of the fighting and try to drive out Al Qaeda, who was formulating into ISIS at the time. He, we were there ground zero. We ended up losing 12 guys out of my company alone and our battalion had the highest casualty rate during the deployment. And some things were due to situations and others were to just poor management and, and bad decision making. But that's, that's a part of the experience. So I, I don't blame anybody. And that's the point is I worked on this book for 10 years, writing things down. One, one of the first things I did when I finished the deployment was to write down as many incidents as I could. And just to have those. And I sat on those probably for five years and didn't do anything with them. But going through my life journey, I just ran into so many people that even though we had just finished all of this stuff overseas, nobody had a clue of anything that went on. Nobody had any idea what was being done. You would tell people like, yeah, they had a civil war in Iraq. People were like, what are you talking about? You guys were over there. What civil war? And you're just like, yeah, these are things. And so that there was an imperative to try to inform people and, and say, hey, these are the things that are occurring and these are the actions that are happening in your name overseas abroad. There's a moral imperative behind that. But there, there's also this idea of a lot of combat infantry grunt guys are really shut down and really closed lipped and it's not so much about like being afraid. It's just like this idea that if you talk about things, you're trying to brag or you're trying to get something that you don't deserve, or maybe you're saying things in a way that might bring dishonor to your fallen comrades and things like that. And because of that, I think those guys' stories, they need to be told. People need to know who these people are because the 12, my 12 brothers that died over there, they're important to me. And 
it's important that other people know who they are and know exactly the circumstances that they died under. And every time you see some sort of military literature or entertainment movie show, it's always in some overtly patriotic way. It's very sanitized. It's very scrubbed. And I was like, I'm not one of those guys. I'm not a special forces dude. I eventually tried for special forces, got my 19 day non-select and all that. But it's, I was a private, I was just a Joe, just out there living and experiencing these things. And because of where I was at, I saw a lot more than people can credit you for. Because you're the guy at the bottom of the total pole and you're just going by day. So I was like, all right, let me start formulating this and pull this together in a story that I can tell people and started talking about your book a little bit and something that people, I don't know, it may surprise people to see it, perhaps not, but you're quite critical of yourself throughout the whole book as you take very, some very hard points with things that you saw and that wishing that something, something had gone different or wishing that the people right above you or even further above you had made different choices. Can you talk about this culpability that you feel you have in this? How do you, and then specifically just a curiosity for me, where does it start and where does it end? As far as if, if you think of it in like a legal and moral sense with culpability, you're like, okay, I was 20, 19, 20 years old. I went over there. I was 21 when, when I left. And because we were there for a year and a half and it's, yeah, at some point you don't want to say, oh, I was just following orders. Cause that's, that sounds very, not the, oh, I was just doing what I was told. There were, there was a moral belief set behind what I was doing. I did go over there believing a lot of the propaganda that was fed to me. I was like, oh yeah, we're, we're fighting for freedom and trying to beat the terrorists that got us on 9-11 and we're, we're doing all this kind of stuff. There was also a like call to adventure on it. I'm not going to miss out on this war. I'm not going to have decades later in my life being like, man, I wish I would have done that. There's that point. But as, as far as like the individual actions of what was going on, I think I'm as culpable as any like 20 year old in that situation. Honestly, it's not like a lot of other wars and, and combat stuff where you hear there was a lot more Wild West, a lot more open. And there was as much as we had a lot of restrictions on us at the same time, it's like the most free I've ever felt in my entire life. And so I struggled mostly with survivor's guilt when I left. That was my biggest culpable deal was like, you look at all the guys who died and were injured and you're thinking, like, wow, these were really good dudes. And, oh man, it looks like a lot of us here are like shit bags and we're not great people. I had two article 15s. I was a knucklehead going through acting like a kid. And when you see all these other people die, you're like, seems like only the shit bags live. Does that make me one of the shit? And then. There's nothing really that I think I can do to like honor these guys because of who I am. It, it definitely has you ask questions about your, your acceptance within the larger group, what happened and how someone reacts to it. I, th this, I hope totally cool if you're not comfortable answering this, but I wonder about the remainder of your company, the guys that weren't wounded the guys that didn't get any kind of major physical injuries of any kind. And they're trying like you, they're trying to deal with all of this. Certainly there'd be people dealing with others, dealing with survivor's guilt, wondering why it was them. Why? And 12 soldiers is a, a wow. That's the, that is up in the, the worst places, the worst stats across all of Iraq and probably Afghanistan too. 12 guys. 12 families not having their kids come home and then everything that comes out from there. And so I'm, I guess I'm just wondering how is the guys that you're still in touch with from that time, how are they doing? How are they, how are they faring through all of the things that were stirring up? There's guys who 
are doing there's there's definitely some guys have more PTSD than others. Take for instance sure. my team leader, Sergeant Crowley at the time. He had already been through like two deployments by the time we went over there. And he had already experienced having loss and having dudes in his squad die. Even though he was is like mentally that this is a possibility and mentally that this is what's supposed to happen. It, it's like how many times can that happen to you before you like break? You sure, know? sure. And it was it's one of those things where it's you almost say it's bad to say, but like him getting injured over there during deployment and having to go back stateside was probably the best thing that happened to him. Sure. Sure. And you know, but there's also guys who've been major successes, they're owning their own companies or they're working doing their jobs and stuff like that. Even then there's still this like cultural sentiment amongst us and amongst Iraq veterans, definitely from the surge and prior who like fit in this cultural part of American society that we don't belong. And on paper, you would think if you should, if you're just looking at a resume and you're like, Oh my God, this dude's like going to Iraq. Oh, he's got a degree. Oh, he's doing this. He's got these accomplishments. Stellar guy. Yeah. Bring him on. Then it's something, something in the air, something in culture where it's no, we don't want these people around. They're like broken. They're abused. And all the guys who could go over and do the things that we did are not people who fit well socially in the first place. You got to weigh that back and forth. Is it more just who I am or is it what these events like turn me into? Sure. I had on my second tour, which was, was during the surge, although what was happening where I was much quieter, the guys that had already been on two tours, three tours, some good friends, some de decent guys, but you could see even in their time already over there that their ability to weather these things had already been degraded significantly. And so for those guys, I am very thankful that our time over there was quieter, that they didn't add in their absence from their family and everything else that goes with deployment, that they didn't add additional physical violence to their, their bowl, their psychic bowl that they have to now carry with them forward. Um, it wasn't to say that we didn't have, we didn't have deaths. We didn't have injuries, but, but note that the, the whole myth of success around the all volunteer force really just degrades and falls completely apart in those things because you can't send the same people you, they have a lifespan. They have a number of times their ticket can get punched and then they arrive at those points. And, but it really tells you a lot about how the American psyche props up all those ideas, how they continue to push those things. And of course, Americans act as though that the military is an electric fence in certain ways that they can scream over the fence. Thank you for your service. But they're only going to get so close because they're still owning those other ideas about, is this vet going to turn violent? Is he going to do this? And it's not that vets can't become violent. They certainly do, but most do not. And most don't need to be treated with those kind of kid gloves. But that is what we have learned to do. The hyper-masculine nature of being an American that they're, they're okay. They're tough. They'll do well, whatever. So let me, let me grab my notes here. I had wanted to. Before we got to talk about a couple specific things, I had wanted to ask you about the, your criticism of heroism and hero worship. And that's something that your book deals with, but the comic book that you've created also deals with in some pretty, some pretty deep ways. Tell, share with listeners a little bit about your thoughts about those subjects. Yeah. Once the book comes out, that's part of the forward. I think I open within the first few lines. I'm not a hero. I was like, I'm not Captain America. I'm not, I wasn't some sort of officer. I wasn't some sort of leader. And mo most of the time in the military, I found myself in trouble. I found myself sticking around the peanut gallery, hanging around kind of the alternate crowd. And it's very weird because it was those kinds of things that I think took me through. I think a lot of that physically and mentally protected me because you can learn. It's okay. Let's not take these things as hard as other guys. Let's 
dwell on this. I you know, have to wake up every day, and I was like, every single day waking. Today's the day I die. I'm going to die today. And so once you make peace with that, anything you do from there is just what. So to to put people on the pedestal, even some of the greatest people that we have in American history and is erase all of the blemishes and everything created that person. Nobody is perfect. Nobody's godlike. I got it. At the same time, we sanitize all of our heroes. And by doing that, we take away the ability to learn the lessons when, from the failures and the issues they had in their life. And that's honestly what's more important, I think, as people and culture is to learn those lessons and hear those things. You had, you had talked a little bit about the Army's pension for awards and about the senior staff, senior ops people at a company HQ, battalion, what have you, getting a bronze star as their tour award. And, yeah. and that's not to say, of course, that, that those guys don't work hard for what they do. They absolutely do. But the bronze star was created as an award for World yeah. War II combat veterans. That's what its initial purpose was. And so my grandfather got one when he was, when he fought in World War II. And I remember him mentioning, because I had talked to him about this before he passed away, that most of the guys that he knew that had bronze stars were dead. You do very few people that had gotten one as a living person. And so I, I explained to him this whole dynamic of what they're giving these out as awards, tour awards, they're not combat awards, they're not achievement awards of any kind. Um, and just how devaluing that is to junior enlisted guys, because for those guys to get a bronze star may mean that they lost a leg. It may mean that they, whatever it is versus these other guys who, it, 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 again, they work very hard, but what they do is not being in active combat. And so it's, it, it makes you almost want to vomit just the thought of it, just the, the idea that we, that again, it's a pe people being put up on a pedestal, but not for anything that retains that same kind of meaning. Uh, and, and I, I really appreciate what you said about the, 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 the blemishes of people that were, when we talk about people like, let's say Dr. King, that we generally talk about the things that are main media consumption items about him. He was born here, he died here. And the things that he said that are most consumable, most easily able to be made into sound bites and put on the news. You mentioned in your forward, now that I'm thinking about it, you mentioned about him having multiple affairs. Does this mean that the ideas he had any less value? No, it means that he was a human being and capable of making poor choices and keeping secrets and having people ask him serious questions, but the serious questions definitely need to be asked. I think one of the big ones I hit up too is George Washington, first president, all that. But the man was a complete failure. The only military action he saw in the British Army was to get captured and kick off the French and Indian War. And then from there, every single battle he was a part of and directed in the American Revolution, he lost. And so it's almost like when you start learning these things and see all this history, it's a tale as old as time. I think it was too young at the time to really understand what was going on around me. But with these awards and things like that, it was more of a, a means to an end. People were trying to pad their careers, pad their awards books, whether they were going to get out or not. They had some sort of system way to move forward. And it did exactly what you said, because by the time I went back active duty in 2012, they were starting to remove promotion points for combat awards and saying, no, you can't use these anymore, or they're going to be devalued by how much those promotion points cost to, for your NCO and your promotions and things like that. And that was just the thing. You would have some shitbag NCO who's going up trying to get his E6, and he's been a complete failure for most of his career, but he has all these awards from the deployment, Bronze Star and all this, and you got to be like, yep, promote ahead of peers. We can't do that. And then 
all the guys who were most of the people who were decent had good head on their shoulders and had some sort of sense about them. They left the military. So you're just left with all of this. And it did just that. I went back in, I used some of my promotion points were valued to get my sergeant, my E5 told me stuff like you use your purple heart this time on your promotion points. You can't use it again. And your combat time started taking that, having that because you had these guys with long deployments and they were taking guys, putting them out in six and nine month deployments. And they're going to their promotion boards and saying, oh, I've got four deployments under my belt. And you're like, that's still not as long as the one deployment. And all the guys who were initially there, ah, if you're going to cheapen something like that, then that's what society is going to see it as. And when you leave and you try to tout that, you're just going to be like, hey, it's not really worth that much. And it shows too, because the military was focusing on all of this stuff, but they weren't focusing on things that matter as far as your job, as far as making what you do cross over into the civilian sector until I think 2018 that army drivers didn't have a CDL for their whole time. They would have to go out and do the same thing that everybody else does to get a CDL. Same thing with the medics, just get out and basic EMTs through paramedic school and all that kind of stuff. And it's, and then even me, infantry guy, I got out and I couldn't, couldn't immediately qualify to work armed security. And they were like, you've got to go through, you've got to get your concealed hand license you've got to do all this you have to go take this course and do that and i'm like how am i not are you certified that's, that's where it goes i think this is a good segue to talk a little bit about some of the comments you made about your sergeant major your battalion sergeant major in the book and it feels like it's a tale as old as time a senior nco being much more concerned about the appearance of uniforms about haircuts, about is the equipment, was the, are your Humvees and your weapons, are they clean? And, and I say clean, not in that, in terms of functionality, yeah. but in terms of looking like it was spit shined in some fucking way. Exactly. Um, and it's so devaluing to the soldiers that have to deal with that. Danny's talked about that numerous times about that the, whomever would show up at his cop in Afghanistan. And that was the thing they cared about. We had guys that were work that were running off five or six hours sleep at night. Didn't care about that. They didn't have access to good places to wash their clothes. So criticizing them for dirty uniforms was like, what the fuck is your problem? Yeah. Um, and it, and it feels that they're never able to, that Sergeant majors and senior NCOs and military leaders all over don't actively go through that as young troops, as guys that don't have rank yet, that don't have power yet and see the ways that those can affect people. But they've spent their entire careers caring about that kind of bullshit, caring about haircuts, caring about how long somebody's mustache is if everybody decides to grow one. And that was one thing that pushed me away from staying in the military more long term was that you come across so many of these leaders who just didn't give a fuck about you. And, you know, whatever happened, whatever criticism you had of them, it just fell on an entirely on deaf ears. But tell me about that from your perspective. How was that dealing with this guy? And what, what value do you think those kind of criticisms actually have? Yeah. We always had the running joke that it was like, they send you off to Sergeant Major School and pull your brain out, and they put the sergeant major brain in. And then from that point on, all you care about is people running on your grass and in uniforms and stuff like that. And it, it's more of, no, it's that type of person is the person who stays in long enough and becomes a sergeant. They've always been that type of person. And there's, yes, is there something to be said for being clean, for being sanitary, and like you said, making sure your weapons are clean, functional, and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, we're living, we started the whole cop thing in Iraq. We were the very first cop and we called it Bone Disneyland because that's, that was the joke behind it, Disneyland. And I didn't have running water. I didn't have a place to shit. I slept 
on freaking the floor until they finally moved in these broken down bunks that we could put in there. And even those pro- probably were like infested with freaking bed bugs and <laughs> everything else. You better bet that you needed to shave your face every single day. Yeah. F2 is just like, what are we doing here? I can't even clean myself. Uh, and I think when we made the push to cop, we stayed out there for four months straight. And that's four months, no shower, no hot food, sleeping in shifts and doing all of that kind of stuff. And that's when they come through. Everything that you've done, everything that you think is important to further these goals that they keep telling you, like we're here and we're doing this to protect people. We're here and we're doing this for these goals. And you think you're, you know, getting close to those goals or moving in that direction. And then they come in and the only thing you get told is you all stink and you look like ass in. You need to maintain some sort of garrison look here. You're just okay. So none of this is serious to you. None of this is serious. Does that mean that the last three guys who died over the last month, you don't care about that either? Like, And it, it's just this weird, like, I don't understand how people can't have that level of empathy of, wow, okay, these guys are getting hammered. They're fighting, they're doing all this crazy shit. And I come here and instead of caring about this thing, I should ask people like, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, but no, no concept of what those folks have really been living through. And that whole cop setup thing made it so much easier for a battalion headquarters to find a nice fob. And then they mm-hmm. would send out the commander's convoy to go to those different places and look at everything. But those folks still eventually got back to a place that had decent showers and a chow hall and probably decent bunk beds to sleep in and all those kind of things. And we had guys from my headquarters company who were working on college degrees while we were out living in cops and dealing with not, uh, I I don't think I ever lived in anything as bad as what you described, but it was not, it was not a picnic either, but they just don't, they just don't see it. They just don't see the value of it. So it, I, I, it must have that. I'm able to get mine. I don't give a, a fuck about yours. That kind of American mentality. But also, to just to a tiny bit in the defense of the sergeant majors, is that's what they've been taught. That's what we've been taught their whole careers, that eventually they get to be the sergeant major and they can make their troops do ridiculous things because they care about that. And so, But they were, they were more than happy to deal with all this shit and then to continue to give the shit out. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter what kind of cycles it creates or how it affects those folks view of masculinity or anything in, 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 in those lines. So I had, I had, I had made a note that I wanted to ask you about, I think it's officer of yours that got hit by a sniper. Am, am I right about that? Yeah. And then another guy who was paralyzed from the shot. It was the same one. So we had an individual who was killed during that incident, PFC bird okay. and Lieutenant Ebar was the guy on deck. Yeah. And. That's more dealing with those interior cultures in the military. And it's another, we went through six lieutenants during our deployment and none of them died, but it was like they would get injured and then immediately pulled from the freaking field and we get replaced with something else. And every single one of them, we told them, you just need to sit back and listen to us and just play lieutenant. Just be in charge, but we'll do this. And none of them wanted to. They wanted to reach out and touch the sun. And five of them did. It's another one. Our early time in Bakuba, we had a mission that we were at an embassy. And when you go to the, the embassy, they had people from that country. And they're in their own space. And they're being like respected as though these military officers would be respected back in the States. They're going in through saluting their officers. Everybody's dressed in embassy dress and all that kind of stuff. And I think he just got the big head and wanted that treatment. And he was a he, classic West Pointer before we, we got him right before we went on deployment. And he linked up to St. Kuwait. And he was already trying to give one of the guys an Article 15 because we were out there running, doing platoon formation running. 
And one of the guys was falling behind. He came back and told him, why don't you keep up? And he's like, why don't you get a shot three or four times like me and then see if you can keep up? <laughs> and he didn't like that. He was trying to give him an Article 15 and do all this other kind of crazy stuff. So rocky relationship. Already. Damn. And yeah, he, from from my understanding of the whole thing, though I recount this from my witness testimony to me, I was at the cop. I, re, I was at the embassy at the time that I didn't see it happen. So this is what was reported to me was that he went up there asking for the private to salute him. And once he did get that salute on an OP, there was a sniper waiting. And then he got shot in the neck and he, he became paralyzed from that. But they also opened up with, with fire and killed PFC Berg at that time. It's, but it's a different culture. People know that West Point culture in the military of you're going to go out and for your career, they were putting a lot of these guys on combat tours and letting them serve the six months so that they could get the patch, so they could say that they were there, they did the combat time, and then pulling them off and promoting them and taking them wherever they got to go. It wasn't often that they would stay that long anyways. But even then, I think our platoon had a special relationship with lieutenants going through six of them. And there was a reason we were called the troublemaker platoon. We had everybody in the platoon had at least one Article 15. So we're just a bunch of knuckleheads and dudes like that. And that relationship was always the same. It was like, you guys come in, we are tell you what it is. You either listen to us or you don't. And if you don't, you're on your own. And did you all have a decent platoon sergeant to mitigate some of that shit? Kind of, but the CAV division as a unit is much different than many of the units I've been in went through. The 173rd have been second ID in Korea, El Paso, and all of that. And there's this just like overemphasis on the things that we've been talking about, on how things look rather than how they actually are. And the CAV is throwing a parade at four every other week for no reason, just show shit off and do this. And that's where this title came from, because we were constantly saying, this is just another dog pony show. We're just doing this for show. We're just doing this for looks. This doesn't really matter what the outcome is. They just want to make it look like we're doing really good. And at that time, there was this like push that Iraq needed to be a success. And that, that's part of that like surge mentality. We need to get all these people here. We need to engage in these ways and, and it needs to be important how we look. And so the first part of our deployment, you know, up to the cop really rough and that was a lot more hands off and you guys just do what you need to do. Once we established that and we did all the hard work, then all of these people from division and all over the army just descended upon us and then everything had to be looking right. Everything had to be correct. Coming in and they're like, oh, we can't call this cop Bone Disneyland. We're going to change it to the Cop Adam. These routes aren't the same that you guys are calling them. We're going to call them red, blue, and green. We're going to take your deal. You can't be coming up on the net saying you're troublemaker platoon. <laughs> you know, it's got to be blue, red, or white platoon, things like that. And so there was this, we need to sanitize everything we do and make it presentable. Yeah. It's incredible the amount of cruelty that can be put on soldiers just by principle of how the order you do something. It just as small as things can touch in on those, on those points. Let's take a little bit and talk about your comic book. So it's called Tales, your, I think your handle on there is Tales of Nihilism, right? And then the, the ballad of Philip Kirshner, am I saying that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please tell the folks about it. Yeah. Originally the whole thing was just called Tales of Nihilism and that's formed and molded into coming like the publication house for mm -hmm an ongoing anthology and we have the main series the ballad of philip kirsch that's what we're working on now and then we run like short stories and we do comic strips and things like that and all that falls under that that tales of nihilism deal but that that was being an artist and engaging in that was a, a piece of myself that i let go 
when I joined the military. I used to be the kid who was always doing the theater, choir, and the art stuff, and that kind of stuff. And once I turned 18, it was like, at the whole 9-11 and everything, it was like, all right, I'm going to do this call to adventure and go do that. And so I disabused myself of that part of myself. I realized that's not cohesive to this culture working well within here and I need to do some personal changes to make it through this. And there's always a little bit, like I was always the guy drawing while I'm sitting there taking notes and stuff like that. And on my Humvee shield, I drew like a combat monkey and till the Sergeant Major saw it and made me think of that. <laughs> and, and things like that. We had a freaking room in, in the cop. Like we just had murals from all the ash. We had thrown grenades in there. So we would draw all over the walls and draw crazy stuff in there. And so, yeah, it was like, I've got a lot of feelings. I've got a lot of things to say. And I also really like art. So let me reconnect with that part of myself. And I started drawing again and painting. And then I kept having the same feelings and conversations with people and talking about how tough it really is in society and how hard it is for people to make it nowadays. And this idea, these dreams that we've been sold growing up and becoming adults and getting older and a lot of it just not coming to fruition. And I was like, all right, let me see what I can do here. And it just so happened that me and my wife were playing the Arkham Asylum Batman video game and I'm playing as Batman and I start walking around the whole asylum and I'm like, wow, this place is awful. Like, where's OSHA? Who's the health inspector here? And what went on? And then I just said it and I was like, man could do so much more and be a hero for Gotham if he just used his Bruce Wayne personality to actually make Gotham work. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's the story I right there is this idea of hero worship and this idea of these godlike entities, these tropes are going to save society and we need to believe in these people and do these things. They're going to take us to the finish line. And I was like, that's how things work. No it's just not reality. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to take this idea and dissect it and pervert the idea of these superheroes and show people just how bad it would be to live in a world of superheroes. Everybody's always taking it from, oh, yeah, there's some collateral damage that goes on. Or you might get a story or two comics where they talk about some non-superhero type characters and struggling with the things that superheroes do. But I was like, I'm really going to get into the weeds. And I want it to just be an average guy, normal dude. And he wakes up, goes to work and does everything like everybody else. And just how bad would it be? Getting in your car, a superhero fight happens on the freeway. That's going to make your insurance premium go up. And then you're showing up late to work. And how many times do you get to use the superhero was battling on the freeway excuse and then fired and then... Your water is getting turned off because the supervillain is like doing this in the water. <laughs> and I wanted to take that idea and say, okay, here's how bad it is to struggle. Now let's put these superheroes up. No, it does. It, it presents a, hmm. a whole host of, of questions about how we really view heroes and how we view hmm. cops and, and leaders and politicians and other stuff like that. But my... <laughs> One, one, uh, observation I made a while ago, and I, I still haven't disproven this, but I, I think it's, I think it's important that I see Batman as the government. The, mm. the, the, the Batman is this amicable, or I don't know who you call it, He's amicable to the innocent people, but that he, he's doing these good things. He's helping people out, like you said, but so, so much lower and nastier than if the billionaire would just put his money towards making his city a better place. But now he is the, and, and very much in the way that we see America is written on the world stage as the indispensable nation. Well, Bruce Wayne, Batman, has made himself the indispensable superhero. He doesn't have to have specific powers. We all know that just by his own inertia of being a person that he can get things done. But who exactly is that fair to? Why does do those people that do those bad things have to pay that awful price 
before they get to the courtroom where the justice is actually supposed to be dispensed. Um, and I know that there's been, there's been more recent comic book stories and stuff where Batman has beat someone up and they got off and the district mm-hmm. attorney just stands there looking at him and says, I can't do anything. This happened. I can't not acknowledge that it happened. And, and this person obviously can't, uh, still can't get, get punished. But back to the indispensable person for a minute that the, we, Bruce does all the things that we think the government does. He spies on people, he invades their privacy. He is willing to go through their homes by himself without their whomever, just because he is the world's greatest detective or whatever. But it goes back to the pedestal thing we were talking about earlier that we've created and we just look up and it's great. There he is. He's going to protect us. He's going to do this and that and this and that. And it doesn't work that way. There are no rules that cover what he can do. There's no kind of a review committee or anything on when Batman beats you to a bloody pulp. And it's not like he's innocent. It's not like he hasn't done things that normal people would look at. And that's fucked up, man. It just, I was going to ask you though, what other kind of comic books do you like to, what do you read these days? So I'm a huge Alan Moore fan. So I'm definitely started my comic history with the Watchmen and all that. And that's what really inspired a lot of the creative processes that I have because I was that kid growing up reading Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and stuff like that. And Spider-Man was about as dark as it got on those comics. And then I watched, I picked up a freaking issue of the Watchmen and I was just like, wait, you, you could tell stories like this in comics. Yep. Yep. This is profound. This is, this should be studied in a college setting. The same thing the, they're talking about these great writers in the 18 and early 1900s. This, this is the same level. And they're going over very deep and contradictory ideas and things that are difficult to discuss. Currently, I'm trying to get a hold of Miracle Man by and do that one. But yeah, read The Walking Dead when that came out and also watched The Boys and stuff like that. But that idea of these, not even going into what do you call it, like the alter heroes or the kind of like Punisher style guys where they're supposed to still be a hero. It's those type of stories to me are more thoughtful and more, they make you think and it's, they say it in the Watchmen, who watches the Watchmen? How are they able to do the things they do and, and get away with it? And what level of culpability do we have as a society for letting these things happen and getting to this point? Yeah, I dig Alan Moore. I, I, he, his way of bringing you full circle into those things is just exceptional. The Watchmen, The Killing Joke is another one that's a, a really great one. V for Vendetta as well is also one of my favorite ones. It, yeah, I, I, I had never read the actual graphic novel before I saw the film. And of course, yeah. if you go online and look at that, that Alan Moore has some very specific nasty words about what happened at the film, but they did, they completely <laughs> removed the anarchy apps aspect of it and let it just be a movie about superheroes. And it does include some of the criticisms that he had, but it's not nearly as pointed as it would be otherwise. I think this is a good place for us to wrap it up for today. I thank you so much for coming and sharing your time with me and talking about your recent work. But when is your, when is your book, when is Troublemaker supposed to be coming out to be able to be read? So we have that scheduled for publication next March. Um, I think by January, we're supposed to have everything edited up and we'll be putting up on the blue ear book, blue ear book site, a link for pre pre pre-orders and stuff like that. But the tales of nihilism, that's completely open. We digitally publish on global comics and all the comics have a link that you can go to and get a physical publication of it. And trying to think, and then whenever conventions come up, we post up on the Facebook, Hey, we're going to get these conventions and you can get comics there as well. Sounds great, man. I will, I'll make sure we put a link to global comics down with the show notes so people can find, get right to where your stuff's at. It's a great comic book. I've really enjoyed reading it. I'm excited for more and I hope we'll have you back again. Maybe around the time the book comes out, we can talk about it a little bit and definitely promote it. Was there anything else that you wanted to throw out there today? 
Yeah, I'd be remiss if I forgot. Also, with the publication, Tales of Nihilism, up on Global Comics and physical publication, we offer an ad space in those comics. Me and my writer, Joseph Miles Pittman. Those comics, the ads go to fund the conventions and the publications and things like that. And it's a great opportunity for anybody who has a small business, especially a veteran-owned business, to advertise with us and help other veterans and artists. Sounds great, man. Sounds great. Yeah, I will. I'll make sure I link specifically to that so people can find find what they're looking for. And thanks everyone for joining us today on Fortress on a Hill. Hope you all take care. See you next time. Money is tight these days for everyone. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. In addition, any support we receive makes sure we can continue to provide our main epistos free for everyone. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim's Everyone Dream, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Ren Jacob, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, Helgeberg, and Howard Reynolds. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. W.